Sanji is uh, more from a distance. He's like, you know, I feel sorry for you. But I believe the energy, what we believe um, that we are working with, we can do things certainly stronger and powerful. The reason is sympathy is more putting ourselves in other person's shoe and feel their pain or challenge them. So it's more personal. It's like I am you. And uh, empathy makes it more actionable. And I personally believe we, the, we are all empathetic. It's all, you know, depend what is our range. Like, for example, when, when our child gets hurt, we don't say, oh, bechara, so lagta hai, yaad kar do. No. We feel that pain as a parent. That's empathy. So by default, everybody is empathetic to their own child. Then the next level of empathy I see, you know, their family, their friends, their society, their city, their state, their country, doesn't matter, global. So what we are doing is truly approach towards tackling the challenge of autism through empathy. Thank you. Desiree, let me ask you this in a, uh, same question, but what's the difference between sympathy and empathy? So when I think about empathy, hiring someone because you're sympathetic or it's out of charity, right? is very different if you look from the perspective of the person with autism. If I'm hired just because I'm autistic, then that tells me that I'm not valued equally as someone else, right? The expectations of everyone in the workplace might be different because they're not looking at me as someone who is hired to do a job because the company believes I can do this job. You're just given a handout. That's very different. I think that that's what a sympathy placement is. Empathy means you are different, you are not less. We are going to work with you. We are going to make sure that you are supported to be successful because we value you. We value your contribution and we want you to be part of the company. Joanne, how important is language between empathy and sympathy in dealing with people? And what words would be best used? I would look at sympathy and learned helplessness. And then I would make an analogy between empathy with going out into the community and changing the idea that the community has of our individuals and what they can bring to the employment force. I think that's a big issue that we have to work on globally. I think we have to begin to take everything out. We have to stop staying inside. We have to start going to organizations and we, start, we need to start doing lunch and learns where we're, we're training the individuals and the staff as to what it is like to hire an individual with autism and what they can expect. Excellent, thank you. Along that line, um, in the United States, as we're approaching uh, many potential employers, in the back of their mind, they think, okay, if I hire someone, that means an eight-hour work day, five days a week, so 40 hours. What is the reality and what are you seeing as the variations within employment and what could an employer expect as far as time commitment? So. Um, in terms of, as we heard this morning, if you know someone with autism, you know someone with autism, one person. Um, so everyone has different abilities and availabilities. So when you take this empathetic approach, that will help you introduce innovation, you know, for employment, because it's not a cookie I see the world of work is rapidly changing with this globalization, uh, digital transformation. People are, a lot more people are working from home. So I think that's a huge change, huge benefit for the autism community and, uh, uh, and, and people with disability. Now the question, 
and that's what we play a role uh, as, a, as, a, as a workforce solution provider to corporations. We help them build those models. So, um, and we help them manage their risk, manage the, the strategy. So when HR or strategic sourcing or procurement has the stra strategy of introducing neurodiverse talent in the workforce, we help them to build those models. So in some cases, some individuals are um, able to work only four hours and we have done that with one of the employer where uh, job opportunity was uh, for one full-time uh, employee eight hours a day we placed two individuals because they were able to work only, only for four hours and uh, it was a great uh, success and at some point when there was a need of second person the person who was working for four hours now he was used to and he, he got um, yeah, uh, comfortable with the position. Now we, we extended that. So it's a little bit of efforts. When employers are hiring, we all do that. When we hire individuals, we put index, you know, some efforts in, in strategy and, and figuring out to make that employee-employer relationship. Joanne, in following that train of thought, it takes very often two parties to create the opportunity of employment, the employer and the employee. What is it that you think is most important for an employer or a potential employer to know about employing somebody possibly on the autism spectrum? Good question. First of all, there is going to be a difference. and. First of all, let, let, let me preface it with, if you hire an individual with autism, they're going to show up, they're going to be there every day, they're going to be on time, they're going to do their job, and they're less likely to leave the job after you've trained them. So these are all great points to make. So we, we want to make sure that we, we talk about what the, what the uh, positive of hiring individuals with autism is. I think that what happens with employees is that one, they need to know what to expect when they get a job and they don't know. This is an issue that we all have to begin to work with. We have to begin early. Parents need to begin to help a child have a vision of what their community is going, to, how their community is going to embrace them. And prior to the last five years in the United States, we didn't get a vision like that because parents were reluctant to tell their child, you're going to work because they didn't think they were. And they, and they didn't want to give them a false hope. And I think now we've crossed a bridge where we have a lot of individuals working. We still have 80% under un, uh, unemployment in the United States. That's not good stats. We have 50,000 individuals with autism graduating from high school every year. So we have an issue. We have an issue that we have to deal with. So going back to what employers and employees. So we have to, it's a learning curve on both sides. And the parent needs to play a really big part in this. The parent needs to begin when the child is five and six years of age of talking about what do you want to be when you grow up? You see, in the past we got, oh, you have two children? Oh, wow, he, he seems very bright. Oh, yeah, he's going to go to Harvard Law. He's just, like, so bright. Oh, what about your other child? Oh, he likes Thomas the Train. Instead of, because the child's waiting to hear what the parent thinks of him, we're giving them, oh, there's no place for you. Instead of, he likes Thomas the Train, he loves trains and he might work at a train station one day. We have to tweak everything so that it's a positive piece for these little guys. So they grow up with the idea that I'm going to work. Good. Desiree, I know. Good. Go ahead. Please applaud. Yes, go ahead. So what we do with employers and how we educate and um, uh, bring them um, on the same page with our understanding is it's not about them, the individual on the spectrum. It's about us. How do we create the right environment for them so they are successful? And um, creating right environment is not not rocket science. It's just putting a little bit of efforts, making everybody aware of their challenges, their strengths, their weaknesses, and 
Once we do that, one of the other thing which we do, which is a little unique and new uh, in this space is sustainability. You build that awareness. A lot of corporations, what we have seen, what they do is they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars at the corporate level to build awareness, to build that culture of inclusion. Um, and it's one time deal. They move on and when they hire few people, and when they try to create this whole environment culture at the corporate level, it's not, it's not efficient, it's not worth, it's not enough ROI. So what we do is we work with employers and we help them sustain that culture throughout this relationship of employee and employee, uh, employer um, relationship. And we provide support, ongoing support. So now, when hiring manager who was personally connected to someone on the spectrum uh, did the hiring, but now they are moving on with their career, the person on the spectrum is, is kind of... So in this, I call this in this rapidly changing, uh, um, uh, highly demanding workspace, work, uh, workplace, how do we sustain this uh, culture of inclusion? So that's, that's very, very important. I think also something that we've done um, at like Madison Fields is we hire people that are not autism professionals, right? People who are professionals at maintaining a ranch or someone who's an equine professional. We hire people who are not part of the autism world. And so there has to be a sensitivity training and make it make it uh, not like a PowerPoint presentation with the DSM categories. Take them out to lunch, right? Let's go to lunch, and I want you to ask the questions that you have, because I know you have questions about your new coworker. It's okay, ask the questions that you need to ask, because you want to demystify it, and if you can do them the coworkers a favor and say, listen, don't talk to him in baby talk, okay? Listen, make sure that if he does something that's inappropriate, just be literal and tell them it's okay to teach them what's appropriate, right? So I think it's really important that you give the coworkers the space to ask com some questions, but also some tips on how to be a good coworker to someone on the autism spectrum. Thank you. Critical stuff, very important. Um, I wanna go back to you, Desiree because there was a, a bit of an allusion to something, or it was alluded to. How do you see that uh, employment and housing exist together, and why can you not just have somebody employed or somebody in a house? How do those things go together? It all comes down to what is gonna make that person happy? What are the environments? that are gonna make that person happy, what is it that they need? So when you're choosing a housing option or you're choosing an employment option, you have to think about, am I choosing this employment option because this person needs a paycheck? Is it because they, need, they want meaningful engagement? They want meaningful work? They want something that they can do every day? Is it because they're seeking social engagement? These are all the same questions for housing as they are employment. You know, when you're choosing a home, you think about your lifestyle, your needs, your wants, and then you can go out and look at a home. And so it's really important that you're asking the individual, what is it that they want to get out of work? What is missing in their life, and how can work or home fill that gap? And that can give you a little bit of direction, right? So for example, if you're talking about people who have high support needs, and this individual, they're getting therapy, they're busy, um, what they need is something that is meaningful where they are caring for someone else, right? A lot of people with high support needs, they're constantly being cared for, constantly being cared for. And so if you can think about, you know what, it would be really good for this person to care for something else, and then start thinking about what it is that they can do in which they do that. So caring for animals, caring for a garden, caring for the community. In an urban setting, it could be that they take a, a cart that has snacks and drinks through the office so that people can purchase it. It will provide the opportunity for them to care for others, right? They are, they are being hospitable to others. They don't have to talk. They just have to walk with a cart, 
right? And someone else can maybe help with the math, the math, or it's all done by card. Another option is instead of having like a petting zoo at the India Autism Center, it's a place where they get to care for the animals. So you're not paying someone else to care for the animals for the autistic person to pet them, right? You're actually creating the employment opportunity. So I am hearing something that those individuals that have often been looked at as being a recipient of charity can also be charitable in their own lives. That's a big switch in thinking, isn't it? And I think it emphasizes that we all have something to give in very important ways. How would you go about looking for ways that people can give at the workplace or in other aspects of their lives? Let me go to you, Joanne. Okay, because yes. you were looking at me, yeah, I thought I it was me. Yeah, okay. I have the microphone. <laughs> so you mean, uh, give me the, the question again, is that how, how can our individuals look at charity? Yes. Correct? And how can we work with our individuals to enable them to be contributing not only at work, right. but into the greater community? And would some of those skills be the same? Yeah, well, I have a program Autism Works now, and we're in our fourth year. We now have, and I'm going to show a little clip, a work program called Glorious Pies, catering company. Kids are on payroll. It's not volunteer. They get paid. Wells Fargo pays them every month. We started out with our facilitator was taking the money. You talk about that. They don't, our facilitator stands back now as all they do is go, we need the table over here, ice chest here, coffee machine here. Everyone sets up. They take the money, they do the customer service. What do you have? We have a, a berry tart, we have a creme brulee, and we have a fruit tart. They've got it down. So it can switch when given the opportunity. It's all about given the opportunity. We have to raise the bar, as I say, and ask these guys to come up to it. And we have to create the environment that they can. So if they don't have a place to work, then it's not, none of this, this is all void. This is like meaningless conversation. We have to give them the opportunity to work. You guys have to here in Calcutta, make the opportunity for these kids to have jobs. Excellent. Nish, let me ask you as a continuation. Uh, you have a cultural background here and you understand things. And we had a little bit of a conversation a while ago about micro industries as perhaps being a way of seeking employment. Uh, of maybe individuals themselves owning small businesses. Um, would you mind talking about that for a moment? Sure. Uh, so based on their strength, I have seen a lot of individuals, they are entrepreneurial, like whether you are on the spectrum or not, entrepreneurship um, is, is a quality anyone can have. And I have seen individuals, in fact, I met somebody the day before yesterday, here and he has his own business he's on the spectrum so uh, the key is how do we build uh, infrastructure or a program which is more form formal where we can help them uh, uh, help them with each and every part of uh, entrepreneurship uh, where they can start their own business because entrepreneurship is not for everyone do you think perhaps uh, a few people that are on the spectrum different individuals that have different skills. Somebody maybe that's good with numbers, somebody that likes stacking, right. somebody that is more comfortable working with clients or with, with uh, customers. Uh, is this a way of looking at a, a micro corporate uh, climate or atmosphere? Right. So see, that's, that's so beautiful uh, thing, right? Because if we can help them find their passion and leverage that, into an opportunity for themselves and for all of us as for a society. I think that's, that's very powerful. And um, there are some great uh, programs in, in US uh, exist where they provide this kind of a support and uh, um, help them build the, the, the programs. Good. Thank you. And we are going to show one more video in just a moment that Joanne wanted to show. Desiree, what one thing would you want to share? 
Um, I think it's important to just overview some of these different models of employment. So one, there's the corporate employment, where you're going to a corporation and you're saying, hey, we have this uniquely abled group of people, help us be able to job carve, help us be able to find opportunities within your corporation that this population excels in. The other model is entrepreneurship. An individual with a disability uh, has an interest, a passion, and you're able to shape a business around this person's passion. They have their own time frame, you have your own support staff, they're interested and passionate in the topic. The third thing is creating a social enterprise, like Gloria Pies, Glorious Pies, Glorious Pies, where a group of families or an organization creates a business for the purpose of hiring people with disability. So those are kind of three different models of employment. And whenever you're doing employment, people with disabilities aren't doing it in a vacuum, right? They have to have support. And one model of support is to be able to instruct them and to have um, a guide, right, and prompting and all of that. Another model of support is to have people working side by side. So I'm not just telling somebody to set the table, I'm doing it with them. Right? And that would take care of a social engagement thing. I think sometimes people on the autism spectrum, they can have a job and maybe they're doing that job and people are telling them to do it independently, but maybe they're missing social aspects in their life and that by working alongside their job coach, it can start to fill some of those aspects as well. And it depends on the individual. Hi. And one Good. of the uh, other support mechanism which we uh, work with corporations is mentorship driven, which is more sustainable. Uh, but again, every individual is different, their needs are different, but where we see an opportunity to make it possible to create the environment, create the mentors within the organization because they know the culture, they know the workplace, so that also can, can help us uh, build a more robust, sustainable employment models. Thank you. Joanne, would you give us a quick introduction into your video? Into, yeah. We're going to just watch a little sizzle reel, but I think you'll get the entire idea. Can you put the other video on? When they swallow chocolate cake, cabbage cake, cake, chocolate again, cappuccino, I think chocolate, I think cream oil. Six dollars each for any time. Buy our glorious pies. You had at least a few visuals there. I want to thank this wonderful panel, and I think we've got time for about 30 seconds each for closing comments. Mm, closing comments. Um, assume intelligence. Um, identify accommodations and maybe a safe person in the organization that's kind of like a go-to person when someone's feeling overwhelmed. Um. This particular event, um, I feel like a dream and can't wait to see the dream becomes a reality. So thank you for organizing such a wonderful uh, event. And at the conclusion of this, let us offer a challenge for you to look around you and to see the community and employment opportunities differently how perhaps for your child, for your clients, or if you're doing something for your child, can it include someone else's? Uh, there's a number of things that we can learn, and I think the community as a whole needs to learn more about our population, and especially adults, and that they can become seen and known in our population so they can be employed. You cannot hire people if you don't know they exist. Thank you very much.